Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in our chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast Network, where you can listen to such shows as On Ramping with D, Announcements with Dr. Petty, Block Channel with Stephen Mackey, Not Another Bitcoin Podcast with Kenneth Bose, a whole bunch of shows, that's the point. But you're now tuned into the Bitcoin Podcast, the flagship show, episode number 136. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, D. Host number three, Corey. What's up, guys? Well, uh, I got some good news for you guys, actually, to start the to kick off the show with. Break us off. I think that Bitcoin has like a brand new HQ in Chicago, and they've exploded in Pennsylvania. They launched three new ATMs just what? in time for Fourth of July holiday. Three new BTC ATMs. Your, in case you need your America Bitcoin. America Bitcoin. Yeah. It's at a gas station, it's at a Dollar General, and a car wash, which are just that's as American as you can get. All right. Is, well, is, is there more to this before I I want I want I want to jump in here a little bit? Yeah, we're brought to you by Athena Bitcoin. That's why I brought them up. They yes. just so happen, <laughs> just so happen to be the most trusted name at Bitcoin ATMs. Um. Those uh, it's it's Philadelphia, Upper Darby, and Wincote. So if you're in the PA area, that's where you can find them. They're also in Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, and a bunch of other cities. Download the Athena Bitcoin Wallet on the App Store or Google Play. And uh, for the other specific locations, all that information is on AthenaBitcoin.com because they're always adding new uh, new locations. And we're also brought to you by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, Bitquick.co which just so happens to be the secure, quick, and easy peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where our listeners can get Bitcoin for cash in as little as three hours. They've been serving Bitcoiners since 2013. Where there's a bank, there's Bitquick. All right, Corey, go ahead. Yeah, so we've talked, we're, we're kind of like, before we guys started recording here, we were talking about what should we talk about? I was like, hey, let's talk about that Craig Wright shit. Um, and prior to this, I had not read anything about it. So as we were discussing about what to talk about, I got on Twitter. Ryan X Charles is Twitter. Did you do like pretty much like a live tweet stream of everything Craig Wright said during the like future of Bitcoin conference, which is some pop up conference. And this like I have never seen so many tweets. Like I don't I don't know how Ryan X Charles did this. But it's almost like a word for word For what Ryan X. Charles talked about, or sorry, for what Craig Wright talked about, this is this is nuts. Give us an example, bro. I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Let's see, um, I don't. Ryan like X. Craig Charles, Wright, so 13 know. hours ago. So CSW, which is Craig Craig Wright, Turing completeness. Mm-hmm. You're all wrong. Bitcoin is Turing complete. The next one. Bitcoin is a decider. Follow Godel. The next one. Bitcoin is two PDA. This implies Turing completeness. Next one. Demo is a Wolfram one one zero Turing complete running on on Bitcoin. Like I don't. There's a good one. Why, why do you think Satoshi used a Japanese name? Because I had a single mother. One of the people who helped bring me up was Japanese. Is he still claiming to be Satoshi? CSW. He can call me a clown all he wants, but I got paid, so I don't care. There is no king. I'm here to kill off Satoshi. Is this guy lost his shit? I don't know. I mean, it's so like <laughs> I I don't know. I think I think it's a, I think it's a fraud, but like 
it's like so they people say that like I guess the Bitcoin Unlimited section is now it's quite clear that Greg Wright is one hundred percent for Bitcoin Unlimited and a very against Blockstream and SegWit. Um which apparently through this conference he has stated that he's going to run a miner that ref- will ref- like I sorry a mining pool that will refuse to process SegWit transactions and is pushing towards Bitcoin Unlimited and everything about everything about them. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know. I'd like to learn more about it. But in my personal opinion, Stu's a fucking psycho. James okay. D'Angelo just said that he's discovered a tragic, possibly even fatal hack of Bitcoin that could be implemented by anyone for under thirty dollars. Oh, I bet that's true. It's not. <laughs> Weird stuff going on. It might be that us. Like, so, like right right now, I know that's not true. Thinking about the like, so recently there's been for DefCon twenty five, the DefCon coming up. One of the talks is how to hack hardware wallets, basically with an oscilloscope. Like it's like use some uh, mm. some power methods for hacking. You have to have a keys. significant level of knowledge. Yes, like, but the but the cost of doing it isn't that bad. And Trezor has basically said, "Yeah, sure, if you have the passcode, like the they're intimately aware of all this stuff. They'll be there for it." This has been known. And it's not that big of a deal. Apparently. I don't know. We'll see a DEF CON. I'm like, it's just, seems what's, like going, what's going on right now in Bitcoin? What is going on right yeah. now in Bitcoin? What are you, you going to say, Cello? I mean, do you guys care if he's Satoshi or not? He's not. I don't give a damn. And I don't care. He's well, not, and I don't care. I'm Satoshi. We're all, right, all so like, Satoshi. Here's, here's like, like in, in, our, in my little, our little worldview, our, our subsection of the blockchain space. <clears throat> like we created this podcast because we basically, we wanted to talk to people. We want to have access to people, see what they're doing, talk to them, figure out why they're doing it, so on and so forth. And in the process of doing that, we just, just release the audio to everyone else for everyone else to hear. And people want to, people want to hear that shit. And so that's how we built our podcast. And eventually as it's kind of, continue to grow i'm starting to get the feeling that this is bigger than us right we all we have like almost a responsibility to do certain things despite our initial like very selfish reasons for building this podcast we just want to talk to people we don't really care what uh, what everyone else thinks and Dude, imagine wait. are we the heroes that bitcoin needs but doesn't deserve no that's a good way to look at it yes Sure. And as I say that, Corey says no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, imagine, imagine, it's like, I, it's like our little project in this space is already getting to the point where it's it's beyond the scope of our personal desires. Maybe, kind of, I don't know. But there's slight hints of that. Imagine so being the person. Hold on. Imagine being the person that built Bitcoin. It's the size and scope of Bitcoin and all of the momentum involved with it, especially if you walk away for it for multiple years, is beyond you. You have no say anymore. It's it's way bigger than you. Yeah. If if Satoshi came back, no one should give a fuck because he hasn't contributed whatsoever to the development of Bitcoin in the past how many years? Five, six years. So he doesn't matter anymore other than the fact that he potentially Seven. has a lot of money. But that's it. In my opinion, it's it's beyond him. There's no reason we should care. Because what Bitcoin is now is not Satoshi. It's it's the conglomeration or amalgamation of all of the things and all of the people who have poured their life into this and created things. And it has nothing to do with him. It's... It's we can thank be- him for creating it. That's about it. Something but, so human and so human and so stupid. Like this is stupid. This is like, like embarrassingly stupid. I think at one point Bitcoin was fun because it was tech- technology. That seemed to be why everyone bought in. But now, now I'm sorry. Your audience sucks. 
Yeah, no, he bro. Oh, it does? Your audio sucks. Fuck. The name <laughs> of this episode is Hotel Wi-Fi. Oh, he's at home. Oh, you're at you're at your brother's? Yeah, hold on, let me see what I can do. Sing some right, elevator cello. music. Cello, continue. Well, Corey, Corey, to your point, I mean, if 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 Craig Wright actually is Satoshi, then it does matter because he knows Bitcoin better and at a deeper level than anyone in core, and that's what matters. Does he? But that's the uh, thing. It's well, like he's, he's he's one person. Satoshi is one. Well, potentially, Satoshi is one person, and. At the time, when it was created, he came up with a novel idea. But as Bitcoin has grown out, it's attracted a lot of incredibly smart people and developers from different expertise who've brought their expertise into the space. That That have legitimate, yeah, have legitimate opinions, expertise, and and know-how in terms of developing this into what it could potentially be. And so now, he's still only one person versus the vast amount of experience with the people who have contributed to the project over the years that he's been gone. So do we throw all of that away because somebody shows up? But there's no, this is definitely easy, a community project. There's very easy pretenses to throw things in or throw or keep th- throw things out or keep them in. And that's the code. Right? So yeah, I mean his that's opinion, what, this was, his opinion this, would be important. But it's he's not a leader anymore. That's what this was about, though, when we first got into it. It was about a technology, and the code works, and that's it. Now it just is a bunch of garbage. It's like really kind of nothing changes but the clothes, and that now it's just a bunch of humans that are greedy trying to get their money. That's all that that, 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 that's all that this is. Like This is what we're watching in live action – and what we've been a part of for the past three years in this stupid debate is HD DVD versus Blu-ray DVD. Well, it turns out one of those solutions changed the world. Yeah, I mean, cool. And it becomes obsolete eventually. Like, if, if that's the analogy we're making. One of those things changed the way people interact with media. So we need to figure out which Bitcoin porn uses, and that's the one that wins. I I ain't, I ain't tipping on Bitcoin. That's for sure. I haven't done it yet. I've seen the option. I haven't done it yet. Um, oh, he's he's another guy that's just he's making unproven claims and conflicting statements. And I want I want to let our entire audience know right now that I actually am Satoshi Nakamoto, and I the proof is I used to watch a lot of anime when I was in middle school. Mm. Japanese. It's Japanese. If, if Bitcoin was created by a black person, that'd be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then hold it on. Would win. I'm going to ask this question. This is a legitimate question. Could you? Do you think a black person would give themselves a pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I just told you I did. <laughs> do you, do is it because person? is it because that black person happens to watch anime? Um, that's not the reason I chose Satoshi Nakamoto. I chose Satoshi Nakamoto because I felt like if this were a fighting game, that'd be a badass name to have. And I would probably carry a bow, a bow staff. That's two and very, very, so, two very different things. Since, since Bitcoin is peer to peer, a bow like Donatello has represents the chain of the blocks. I feel like nunchucks would be way better of a a representation that's of why blockchain. I, that's why I did all of this. No, totally not nunchucks. It's, it's, it's nunchucks a block connected. It's two blocks connected by chain. Or why? Why would that not be better than a bow staff? Because a bow is just the block, and you think you're trying to think too many things at once, Corey. You just need to think of the block. <laughs> okay, just think of the block. That's why I did all of this. Okay, look. Okay, let's just get this out in the air. Craig Wright's an idiot, and anybody who is using their influence to try and, and decide or help people decide which way the code should go is dumb. What all of you smart people that are listening or doing need to go do right now, people that code. And I know this puts a target on my back of one of those people that says, I don't code. 
I know you probably stopped listening. You tuned me out. I don't code. But you do. Why don't you go look at SegWit's code? And why don't you go look at Bitcoin Unlimited's code? And the better code should be the one that wins. And you don't listen to a person. Because Bitcoin was actually put forward so you didn't have to listen to people. Trust the code. So go read the code and you make your decision there. I'm still reading all these these tweets. They're saying that Roger Ver, Bitmain, and Wright are all cooperating together. Oh, they are. It's it's that is Bitcoin Unlimited. What did you hold the up? What did you call? You're... What did you call him before the show started? Oh, Roger Verman. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty. Roger Verman. It's pretty creative. Dude, he would be the person that's cursing and fist pumping towards Captain Planet. At the end of the show, He's, I don't know. Like, I, I, to be no, honest, to be honest, personally, yeah. like whatever happens to Bitcoin, like I personally feel that Segwit should be should go through, and then there should be a two a two megabyte hard fork to increase the capacity. That that, in my opinion, is the best route to go. But all in all, I don't really care. I want something to happen to increase the capacity of, of Bitcoin. Because the current state yeah. of Bitcoin is stagnant. And if something happens, we can move forward and start doing more implementations. All, like, and, and everyone who has looked into this that I have, I guess, researched is basically saying the argument nowadays has nothing to do with technicalities. It has nothing to do with the safe way to scale things. It has everything to do with who gets to decide on how to scale things. It's 100% think, yeah. political. No one gives a shit the about the actual implementation. It's about who actually gets to decide these things. Because up until now, like we've never had this split in ideology on how things should work. And now we do. And so it's like, oh, well, which, which camp's the winner? I think that the whole conversation is starting from a very bullshitty place. And that's a place of a fear of failure. Bitcoin doesn't want to move and it's stagnant because people are feared that it's going to fail if we change them. Well, the price will go down. We fork in the two coins or there's a large fork. The price will go down and a lot of people on will lose one money. of them. Uh, there's potentially both. If there's a large if there's a large enough contentious fork, the price will go down for both. Why? Because there's a giant lack in confidence. Talked about this last episode. The volatility yeah, lives in the difference between we've utility talked. and speculation. And there's a lot of speculation. We've, if you lose confidence, that volatility drops. We like talk, talked about forks for like we've been about forks for you. And we know that's gonna happen. The public doesn't know that's gonna happen. I say the public people that don't care about Bitcoin. They still don't know that's gonna happen. Like, we still are really underestimating how small Bitcoin is. Like, yeah, it's getting a lot of media attention. Yeah, Mark Cuban is saying, like, Bitcoin's in a bubble. My name's Mark Cuban, and you should listen to me because I invest in widgets on TV. Like, okay. <laughs> like, there's a bubble. Hashtag, Whatever. come on our show, Mark Cuban. By He's, the way. He just invested in an ICO this week. Yeah, Mark Cuban is a big old ball of rich and he's doing what rich people do and that's play mind games with other rich people bitcoin's in a bubble i want to see if i can put some money in it real quick and cash in on it like he's that's what rich people play rich people chess games he's doing his thing should expect no different what i'm saying is is that even if bitcoin forks it's incredibly tiny on the global scale it'll fix itself before it even gets anywhere near like, it'll just be growing pains. Yeah, it's going to take a hiccup. It should be looked at as a natural market correction if that does happen. Because Bitcoin has had bubbles and it has had these astronomical growths. And if it gets to a point where it's just there's so much money out there, well, there's going to be a fork and then there's going to be another dip in the price. But we all know what happens next because we've been in Bitcoin long enough. 
So if there's going to be a fork, there's going to be a fork. But progress needs to be made. Like, it's getting it's getting embarrassing now. Well, if people don't like it, they can always go to a different coin. Yeah, that's true. Those options exist now. Like they, they, they literally exist, and there's and there's they, nothing that Bitcoin can say or do about that. Like they, like they, literally, Bitcoin can cease to exist, and cryptocurrency would be perfectly fine. They've existed for a very long time. Like they're going to always exist. I'm just talking about Bitcoin in and of itself needs to make some sort of progress. In. It's embarrassing. We'll see what happens. What what are y'all what are y'all's plans here? So what are y'all doing with um, whatever things that you hold in in light of this unstable, possibly unstable environment of the near future? Uh I'm really debating taking everything and putting it in a hardware wallet. Um and watching closely. I I really don't know. I'm waiting for my my ledger blue. Yeah, I feel like I wanna... they need to send us something. <laughs> <laughs> hey ledger, Are send us listening? something. Ledger, hey, ledger. listening. Like we keep saying your name, and you're not sponsoring us. So it leads us to believe that you don't want to sponsor us, which is okay. Or they're not listening. But you just need to say it louder. We say it louder, then they'll know. Yeah. We need to. I'll, t- I'll uh, amplify this. I'm not gonna buy one. Like you know, I always hated buying wallets. Like using money to store my money. I just, I just feel like it should be a public service gift to everybody. That's not a realistic expectation. Wait a second. You buy like regular wallets. That's what he just said. But he yeah, I'm like talking about it. like, like a bifold back in the day. Like I always, I was like, man, I want to buy a wallet just to put my cash in. Such a waste of money. <laughs> You just show up with wads of cash everywhere. Like our <laughs> rubber band man. Uh, um, I, just don't, I just don't feel like I should spend money to hold my money. You got to hold your money in style, though. Yeah. You got to get a money clip with a money sign on it. So when you pull it out, you, know what? you can stare at people. I always thought a wallet was an accessory that like, maybe was hot fire back when paper money was first invented. But now it's not like you take out your wallet and people are like, whoa, this guy's got a Dolce & Gabbana wallet. Look at this guy. Like if a guy complimented me on my wallet, I would think like, that's strange. Like why are you watching me that close? One. Two, uh, it's just a wallet. Like it can literally be Velcro camouflage wallet. It doesn't matter. But anywho, that's, that's my rant on wallets. Uh, I feel like if rant. I was if I was in line behind someone that had a Velcro wallet, I might speak up. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah, with a cool wallet, man. Yeah, yeah that's G say, Joe. That's the coolest wallet. It's every my time it's on the block wallet. <laughs> every time you spend money, it makes a noise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's um, get in the interview. It's been like thirty minutes. Or I don't so. want to do that. I want to keep talking trash. About Craig Wright claiming that he's me because I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. Well, I ran through all the tweets. So that's just a fact. What if, like, what if uh, Bitcoin was created by a black person and then they just felt compelled to conceal the fact that Bitcoin is black owned for fear of racial bias and that they're going to lose patronage and products and service? You know what I'm trying to say? Um, I'm not, not even going to touch this one. I'm not even going to touch it. So what you're saying is I invented Bitcoin and then went into hiding because I thought that my community would not accept me for being the inventor of the world's I just, I just feel like Satoshi Nakamoto is such a clearly made up name. Like, hey, Bitcoin was created by Sanjay Gupta. No, it wasn't. It was created by like Jerome uh, uh, Jameson or something. I don't know. See, now I know why Craig Wright's going crazy. It was created by Demetric Ferguson. That's a believable name. That we create a cryptocurrency. You know why you feel that way? Because you're talking to a man named Demetric Ferguson. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I, I mean, if cryptocurrency was created by Dr. Petty, eh, I don't know, that's not believable. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's just some white dude. <laughs> you sound like a Mega Man villain. Dr. <laughs> Dr. <Doctor laughs> Petty. Have you gotten past the Dr. Petty stage? God, you're yeah. annoying. It's so hard. I can't wait to get the Dr. Petty weapon. It keeps me so hard. Um, no, I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. You guys can inbox me if you want to. I'll tell you all about it. It's crazy cryptography. All right, so who's who's, who's the interview? Who do we uh, do? We did Moritz. Moritz has, has been on the show a bunch as a teacher, but now he's coming on as a reporter. Mm-hmm. And uh, joining him is uh, a co-founder of New Fund, uh, Mr. Marchin. And New Fund is building a blockchain-based and investor-directed platform, which uh, they they bridge the world of cryptocurrency and equity. Uh, and they are in Germany. Pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool interview. Cryptequity. Cryptequity. I just made a new. I just made a new word. That could Take that it. could catch on. Cryptequity. Take it that, to the bank. That if I hear work. anybody using it, hear anybody using it, I'm suing. <laughs> Get that patent. TM that right now. I want to let the world know. You just heard it here first. Crypt equity. All right. Here it is. All right. So, Moritz is no stranger to the show, making his third appearance on our podcast, but this time not as an academic, but rather a blockchain reporter. <laughs> and uh, joined with him as the co founder of New Fund, Mr. Marcin Rudolph. And. Yeah. Hey there. Newfound just so happens to be the first open venture capital fund. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being on the show this week. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. So um, I guess tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and what kind of led you to this and, and kind of the type of platform that you guys are building here. Certainly. I'll let Marcin start first. All right. So uh, we are building a, a platform that is basically a, a reboot of uh, present uh, investment ecosystem. And uh, this platform is uh, primarily targeted to the off-chain startups or off-chain projects that w- would like or would like to leverage this nice, uh, very open and uh, very interesting new way of funding, which is ICO. Um, and uh, we are doing this via tokenizing equity, tokenizing private equity. Yes, so uh, um, Neu Fund is able to uh, represent uh, off-chain equity as a token. And uh, due to that, we are able to ICO any kind of business uh, on-chain. This is from the project side, from the startup side. On the other, on the, on the other side, uh, we are providing access to the ICO. Uh, to anyone uh, via blockchain, and uh, this is this is this is also tar- targeted to the to the to the off-chain VCs, but also to the to the existing um, crypto community. Yes, so so Neu Fund is not not a VC fund. Yes, uh, we are an ecosystem on which uh, the ICO process is available to any kind of uh, uh, off-chain startup off-chain startup that has equity to, to sell. Right. I think the important point here is that it goes beyond the blockchain world. Basically, any company can use this uh, this to process to uh, fund themselves and gain access to a much larger pool of capital than just the investor or VC world. But uh, let's make sure that everybody actually understands who we are. <laughs> so, Martin, why don't you introduce yourself and give a little bit of uh, uh, understanding of your background? Okay, so um, I'm CTO in Neufund, yes, and I basically basically work with the blockchain technology in there, uh, but also I'm uh, responsible for like a concept of our token economy, yes, because uh, uh, we also have like a blockchain business model that is driving this innovation, driving this investment on, on our platform. Uh, so th- those are my prim- primary responsibilities. Uh, in the past, I was a founders, uh, founder of, uh, of uh, several startups, uh, and so, so I ha- have also I also know this other side, yes, of this equation, like uh, people that are looking for funding. So basically, this is this is my background. Very good. Um, and my background is uh, well, I dropped out of two college degrees. Um, one was philosophy and economics. The second one was uh, kind of a business program. So I have 
that uh, progression from theory to praxis. Um, and uh, I spent the last two years in Chile and Brazil working at a company called Exosphere, where we did uh, educational programs, partially also in the blockchain world. So I organized one of the world's first uh, eight-week residential developer trainings for Ethereum. That's kind of how I entered this space professionally. And then just recently, about a month or so ago, I uh, after coming back to Germany from Brazil, uh, joined Neufund as a blockchain reporter, which means that I'm helping our company basically do all kinds of things, business development, PR, communication, all these different things. So before we, we dive into Neufund, I'd, I'd like to ask you, if you, because I'm, I'm quite partial to education myself, and I know that it's, and I'm sure you can agree with me, really lacking in the space, especially good, yes. good programs that like can teach people a quality standard of education or knowledge uh, to kind of boost them, bootstrap them and get them out in the world so we can have like real developers. Right. And there's a there's also this other heavy need for developers in the space that have this standard of knowledge. What do why did you switch? Was was your education was like, okay, this is fun until I find something that's going to propel me and something I would rather be doing or was the space difficult? Do you have did you have problems? Tell, tell us about it. Uh, no, it was more of a personal uh, kind of career and life decision. So I uh, decided that I wanted to get more serious about my career. And uh, the company I was working with, Exosphere, I did not have the opportunities available in the short term that I was looking for. So I decided to uh, leave and, and look for something new. That was basically just a personal decision. But uh, in general, um, I think both of these are, of course, very much needed. Uh, actually, uh, recently we were at Blockchain Expo here in Berlin. And uh, we met um, one of my previous, uh, one of the previous uh, teachers at our Exosphere programs for Ethereum, who is now also part of this uh, company called Blockchain Academy. And they are uh, pumping out um, courses both in the, I believe, in the programming side and on the kind of educational concept side. So I think lots of these companies that I didn't see when I started uh, offering these courses uh, are now popping up everywhere in Switzerland, in Germany, in New York, everywhere. So I think uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, people trying to rush into the space and, and uh, fill it out. So uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm quite partial to that as well. And also, I, uh, of course, a huge part of what I'm doing at Neufund is also ed educating the general public and investors and startups about all the different sides of this equation in our ecosystem. Uh, so uh, the education part is still uh, very much close to my heart and uh, part of my responsibilities. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I have I'm, I'm kind of naive on the on the topic and I wanted to kind of ask a question i'm kind of nervous to ask it because I, I don't know if i can word it correctly but yeah from what i understand like it allows tokens to not only represent ownership in a blockchain network but zoe said that it also offers equity in off-chain companies so i guess what i'm understanding is like tokens don't represent shares directly they represent a share in a fund which owns shares of the company correct i'll let fortune um, uh, okay, so uh, uh, no, no, no. This is this. Uh, yes. So uh, let me explain uh, how it works. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so okay. So uh, Neufund is able to uh, to 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 take a cap table of existing company and represent this cap table on chain. Yes, as a, as tokens. So the shareholders um, uh, instead of uh, having uh, paper shares, they can use uh, a token, yes, that repre represents this share. Yes, and there is a legal structure behind that makes sure that any token holder, yes, including the founders, but also people that will acquire those tokens in the ICO process, that they have a full shareholder right. So they can vote, they can get dividend, they can even uh, uh, convert, the, convert this token into entering the cap table, they really want that. So uh, they are fully covered legally as well. Yes, this is this is this is uh, this is the token that we are I see on our platform, and I think this uh, there is some misconception on, on how this platform works. I think this comes from the our old white paper where, where indeed we are planning to launch a virtual VC fund, but we are uh, we have found a simpler way to do it or a more decentralized way to do it. Yes, so right now we are allowing any investor. Uh, to create a fund starting from the individual account or uh, something more complicated up with the governance they can choose. Yes, and they are doing this 
individual investment decisions yes and uh, i think what 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 is the most interesting that we are rewarding investment itself yes so if you invest on the noifund platform you are not only getting this equity tokens but you are mining a token that we call Neumark, which is basically a Neufan token. And this token represents ownership of this whole ecosystem. And this ownership means basically that you have uh, access to the revenues that are coming from the fees that we take, a small fee that we take from every ICO. And also you, you have, uh, uh, we are taking a small fee that is we call participation fee, but in, in this equity tokens. So, if you invest on the Neufan platform, you are not only getting these equity tokens that you invested as a shareholder, but you also are getting a little bit of money and a little bit of any token that was ever I see on this platform. And this is your reward for contributing investment and uh, growing the ecosystem. Right. And we basically use the analogy here to explain it to people who have trouble understanding that relatively difficult, uh, complex concept. Um, basically, if you think about Bitcoin and Ethereum, right, they do this, this, the same thing. If you put your computational power um, or your computers uh, to the network and give them, uh, like, make them solve the, the problems that actually uh, mine the coins or the tokens, um, then you get rewarded for it by getting those tokens or those rewards. Not only the transaction fees that are part of the, each block, but also the random reward that is uh, awarded to somebody who gets the block first. Now, we are using the same concept here, but, but with us, the mining process is not an automated uh, machine uh, uh, thing, but rather you, com well, it is kind of, you commit uh, part of your um, your capital to this ecosystem or to this platform. And as a result, new Neumark tokens are created or mined. So in a way, with us, the investment process is a mining process of these tokens. This is commonly referred to, if I'm not mistaken, proof of stake. Uh, you're basically staking a percentage of your tokens in order to, I guess, commit virtual miners in order to mint new tokens. Is my correct here? Martin? Yeah, so, um, yes, this is, yes, you, yes, you are getting reward for committing a capital to the ICO, yes? So you can do it like a via commitment or you can actually invest. That's true. Yes. So uh, if you have a higher stake, like uh, providing more capital, your reward is also higher. Okay. Um, then that, that springboards me directly to my next kind of question, which is how are you differentiating yourself from platforms that may be doing something similar, such as Bancor on the Ethereum network that provides liquidity amongst all the things that may want to tokenize themselves or the Waves platform, which is kind of a blockchain that enables people to create digital assets that also based on proof of stake or delegated proof of stake, or even something like Equibit, which is specifically making a play towards the equities, the equities sharehold, like share space. Is there, is there something that your platform differentiates, differentiates itself in that these ones don't quite get yet? I'll add you on that one as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, um, Okay, I think there are, you mentioned many different projects and uh, I think what what is uh, different uh, from any of them is that uh, we are really a token creators, yes? So uh, we are not uh, a secondary market platform that is hedging on existing tokens or existing assets. We are bringing new kind, we are bringing new projects on chain and we are tokenizing them and we are creating new tokens, yes? I think this is the, the difference. This is a primary market project mostly, yes? And uh, uh, yeah, this is, I think, the one, one difference. The second one, that uh, we are dealing with the particular kind of token. Yes, this is a fully legal uh, equity token. And I think equity token is a, is a, is a great concept. It, it is, uh, equity can represent any kind of business model. So we are not just, uh, we can, we can, so we are not limited to uh, typical blockchain business models like uh, uh, the usage token that controls some kind of resource, like, uh, I don't know, Fizecoin is uh, created a token that gives you access to the storage, yes? Or Golem gives you token that controls access to the computing power. We, are, uh, we have a token that rec can represent any business model. Even a shoe factory can be represented like that. So I think this, those are those two differences. Oh, yes, Corey, any follow-up? 
Oh yeah, sure. Uh, um, I got a lot. <laughs> 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 well, I think uh, one one thing really kind of uh, uh, like uh, highlighting worth highlighting here is that. Um, we are really making a lot of effort to make sure that the integration of the technological solution to the problems is also um, tightly linked to the legal uh, security. And uh, as we've kind of seen on the conferences uh, that we've attended this year, and also the general conversation taking place in the space on Reddit, on Facebook, on, and on other platforms, is that uh, people are really dying to put like real effort behind developing this technology um, further. People are willing to put capital uh, and human resources on the task. The banks are, of course, have been on this for quite some time, but uh, even regular institutions, let's say some of the larger companies are getting ready to invest in the space or use the technology for certain things. And But the thing that's holding them back is, um, especially when we're talking about financial assets represented by blockchain, is the uncertainty of the legal situation coming down the road one year, two years, five years in the future. Because currently there is no clear uh, communication from the governmental authorities or regulatory authorities on how they're going to treat this and if there is, um, then it's generally punitive or uh, not very encouraging, except for jurisdictions such as Switzerland or Dubai. So uh, currently, th this whole uncertainty is holding back um, people to invest in it in all kinds of ways and is encouraging people who are not really uh, legitimate or are more shady people to really kind of flourish because there are no objective metrics and no legal enforcement mechanism to prevent them from uh, actually fulfilling the promises that they make in an ICO that is very well marketed but has no technical substance behind it. So what we're doing to prevent that and to kind of advance the the, the development of the space in general and the conversation in it uh, is to make sure that our platform is tightly integrated with the legal existing legal system and uh, we are also working on, this is actually something that we're going to publish at the end of this week but is not out yet, um, we're working uh, closely to or with uh, the regulatory bodies to try and influence the regulatory um, outlook on these things by starting a conversation in this space, uh, collecting many companies and organizations in a regulatory initiative and uh, presenting, uh, especially uh, this Friday, a report, for example, to the European Commission and then opening up that um, that whole conversation to the public. So what we're tr really uh, doing differently than the existing systems, except for maybe CoinList, who is also trying to make this legally secure with their SAFT structure. I think it's called Safe and Future, no, something like that, SAFT at least, you can look it up on the website, um, is, is this legal integration, which is really crucial for making this uh, work over the long term and not just as a funding mechanism or sp like financial speculation asset. I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that that a lot of what you're 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 starting from scratch instead of saying, "Hey, give us a bunch of money because we're taking advantage of this SEO craze," and then we'll figure out what to do in terms of regulatory framework and how to build our product later on. It's I think right. it's important to start from square one and make sure you have all your bases covered. And because we're we're encroaching upon this space and it's being noticed by traditional finance um, regulators, entities, so on and so forth, and when that hammer comes down eventually, the ones that aren't prepared for it will probably be the ones that don't survive. Exactly. I mean, we're really trying to build a solid foundation here so that we're not surprised. And that and the people who are counting on us to do their um, project management and fundraising uh, with us are not surprised by some negative event in the future. Was that was the 2.1 mil you, you guys raised sufficient to unlock all the resources you wanted to unlock to fund you know startups and various forms of tech innovation? Martin? Uh, sorry, could you repeat please the question? So the, the seed fund that you guys raised, that I think it was 2.1 mil, uh, you, you know, I know you guys are, are focusing on attracting various amounts of startups, and I wanted to know if maybe, you know, the money you raised, was that sufficient to unlock all the resources that you wanted to unlock uh, to fund, you know, various startups, various forms of tech innovation? Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, uh, our primary objective right, right now is uh, building this uh, liquidity pool on our platform. Yes, and uh, so uh, so our internal funds are, are sufficient right now, and uh, we are focused 
And this is uh, this is uh, what is uh, our ICO is going to be about. It is going to be about building a uh, liquidity pool that is, will be available to be invested on this platform. Yes. So uh, so uh, Neufeld ICO is not going to be a typical pre-sale of a token when you acquire a token for certain amount of money, but this money goes to the I don't know to the Neufeld or to the to the to the founders or to the team. Yes, for further development. In our case. This money still belongs to people that took part in the ICO, but it is committed to be spent on uh, on certain ICOs that are gonna be available in the future. And for that, you're gonna get your normax right away. Yes, and uh, yeah. So this is this is our objective right now. So in a sense, what we are doing differently is we're not asking you to part with your hard-earned money and just trust us that we are going to be virtuous mm -hmm. and, and do everything the right way or even just uh, out-compete our competitors. But what we're doing is we are asking you to commit the funds for exclusive use on the platform in the future, um, and, uh, and but they're still yours. So you're not actually handing over the money to us. Um, and in that sense, we're not profiting directly from that from that liquidity building uh, which is not an ICO, but really a liquidity building event. Um, uh, and also what I just want to clarify, which I think wasn't clear, is that the 2.1 million that we raised, we're not doing a fund in a sense where we are uh, kind of governing a fund that decides to invest in certain startups. No, we're using those that initial capital that we raised for building the platform paying the developers, um, doing the, the, of course, the community work and all that stuff, development work, um, and then um, opening up the platform to uh, all the sides, the investor side, the startup side, and then maybe in the future also something we call contributor side who can help with uh, marketing ICOs or, or similar things. So, yeah. In a sense, you're you're making sure that like the initial capital raise was for building the infrastructure that allows all of the parts of your, your platform to work properly, correct? Yes. Um, something that I guess you you wanted to mention before we started recording was something about entangled tokens. How does that how does it play into this platform, and what are those? All right. So um, this is uh, this is something that I uh, discovered um, recently. We were deploying a smart contract that uh, that were basically uh, tokenized equity of the Neufund itself. There were those are options for equity that we distributed to our uh, to our employees, yes? But during that process, uh, I learned that the gas price is really high, yes? I mean, like uh, when you are deploying those contracts, mm -hmm. you basically basically pay a few hundred dollars for this, yes? For that, I can acquire a nice virtual machine somewhere for a year or even more, <laughs> yes? And <laughs> yeah, so uh, so I look why it's like that, yes? And it, it seems that the... Uh, Gas price, yes. That the that the what you pay for the uh, for the execution of the smart contract. So this, the purpose of the Ethereum network, uh, it's not governed by this market. It's it's governed by the speculators that are or investors, yes, that are um, putting a lot of money uh, into into Ether as a, as an investment. So you have a kind of entanglement of the usage at, and of the investment in one token. Mm, okay, and yes. this uh, this is. Uh, this is really creating some problems for this kind of economies, yes, because uh, uh, instead of having a fair price for a resource that is governed by this network, in the case of Ethereum, it is the smart contract, it's a computing power. Uh, instead, you are having something that is governed by the investment or speculation. And this is a problem, yes. This is a problem, and uh, that's why I started exploring this and... Uh, I think the <laughs> this is this is really interesting. It's it's it is like it, investing in the Tesla factory by buying Teslas. Yes, you are buying basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are, it's, it's, I don't know. I, you, you I are buying maybe... basically computing power. Yes, as an investment, which is can... which is rising prices of the of this computing power, not due to the I don't know some uh, costs of this, but due some to... organic network adoption. Yeah. Yes, uh, some, but due to investment process itself. So uh, this this is what I call entangling tokens, and uh, uh, yeah. So Neufund is basically disentangling these tokens by creating this equity token. But this is something that is interesting, and I'm not sure very well to research the, uh, right now because yeah. most of the networks, if you look at, at the ICOs, people are saying those are 
asset tokens or uh, app tokens that's gonna be used to purchase certain services from the network. But the reality is that those tokens are investment tokens and uh, the, the, the value of this token is basically the, the investment value. So uh, the problem doesn't exist because those networks are not ready to be used. Uh, right now, it seems that everything is okay, but at the moment, they will be used uh, by to, like Ethereum network for, for, for the purpose. I see that there's going to be some troubles with the pricing. I see what you're saying. So I, you, you have this you have this entanglement tokens are basically any token that has a connection between the financial success of the platform and the utility of the platform. And most of the tokens that we have right now, we'll take Ethereum, for example, because it's, it's recent price exuberance. Um, the financial success of the Ether token has negatively impacted the utility of the network itself, which which is, right. is the wrong direction in which you'd like to go if you'd like to scale out and be financially right. successful and also keep a very large amount of utility for the network. Right. It basically pits the investment part, process, which should in uh, theory or, or ideally be basically a starting uh, investment into the, a network, like a seed thing that makes it uh, come over the initial barrier of coming alive. Uh, it pits that whole idea against what you're actually trying to achieve, which is organic adoption of the network, uh, by making those like uh, oppose each other. Because if you invest more, then the price of the token uh, becomes higher. And as a result, fewer people will adopt the network for legitimate uses because it becomes more costly. So it's kind of a, a, a strange economic logic where you pit the, the two things, like the, the thing that you actually want against the thing that you're trying to use to get where you want to go. Yeah, I've been thinking about that quite a bit myself and trying to form a kind of a framework of logic around it so I can explain it better to other people. And I think maybe this this idea of entangled tokens can help me get there. Um, what else What else is there that we didn't quite get to ask um, you about that you wanted to tell us about? Well, I think um, one thing that Martin mentioned kind of uh, in, in flying over it, <laughs> uh, which is interesting to explore, uh, is what we did with our ESOP or our employee stock option program or plan, um, which we tokenized. So we actually, because we want to make sure that our processes and our technology works uh, correctly and uh, before we put it out to anybody to trust us or the technology, uh, we decided to put our own skin in the game and use um, the, the kind of the conceptions that we've developed on, our, on, on ourselves. So what we did is we took the idea of an employee stock option plan where you distribute uh, employee stock op or you distribute stock options to employees to incentivize them to give their uh, work to the company and, uh, and and work hard to make it succeed um, and we did that which is usually a very like dry and uh, costly uh, legal process and we uh, transformed that by tokenizing it and made it a relatively enjoyable although emotionally uh, <laughs> quite a <laughs> difficult process because uh, we I basically I posted this earlier today but uh, we uh, made it live onto the main network yesterday and uh, going through that process really showed us how not ready this technology is for like mass adoption because you really have to uh, step out of your existing mental models for how these uh, things work and and really um, be open to let the technology dictate how you think about it. And so uh, what we did is uh, we actually all have um, Ledger Nano S's uh, for everybody in the company. And so we had a little launch party where we uh, offered uh, the options to our employees uh, and then they had to sign it with their uh, with their ledgers. And uh, a couple of times somebody uh, like gave the wrong address or somebody didn't understand how to do it. And so it's <laughs> it's huh. a, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Starting to see the kind of the, the real practical use case in, like implementation problems that you face when trying to do this with people who don't quite understand the technology which are going to have right. to be overcome eventually when you want to do things like that. Right. Yeah. And but, this is a but, huge part of my task. Like I have to <laughs> I have to make sure and it's a part a, a huge task for us as a platform to really get uh, everybody who's part of the platform in sync over how this works from all angles because if the investors don't understand at least from a uh, like to a, to a small degree how blockchain technology works and how it works differently from the existing processes then uh, it's going to be very difficult to get them to trust us to uh, convert their existing processes to uh, our platform 
Um, and the same thing goes for startups. Um, if they don't understand how it works, then uh, why should they go to us uh, and trust us with uh, with how it works? So, yeah. All right. So I guess we can transition kind of into the future a little bit. Uh, I guess talk a little bit about the timeline through 2017 into 2018, kind of where you are now and, and kind of where you, you plan on having these things kind of starting out. All right. Uh, so uh, right now we are working on uh, on um, on our ICO, and uh, um, uh, this uh, this ICO uh, should happen around September. And uh, after that, uh, we believe that we can deliver the platform, so the 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 mode, the working ICO process, and the universal side and the UX that is gonna be uh, that people can trust. Uh, by the end of the year, so this is basically basically our plan. All right, this this is kind of the the the, the rough roadmap for how we're going forward for the next year or so, or, or six months, I guess. But the uh, the vision beyond that, I think, is really what excites me the most, and why I actually joined and signed up to the team, uh, because. Our eventual goal is to kind of make ourselves redundant. Like, <laughs> and I don't, I don't think, and I hear many people <laughs> trying to say that <laughs> when they when they offer that. It's it's, <laughs> it's also something that uh, investors you don't shouldn't tell to your investors because uh, they they're kind of uh, they're they're scared of that. <laughs> um, but the basic idea is that we want to how uh, Trent McConaughey I think put it very well recently in his Medium post. Um, we want to melt the company into the community in a sense. So we want to build this platform. That's why we raised money, why we are doing the ICO, and uh, what all that we do to to bring people on there. But then once we have all these processes uh, established. We want to make more and more of them uh, work independently of us as a company. And so uh, that's the, the eventual end goal, have a more decentralized, more open, more accessible investment ecosystem that uh, people of all shapes and sizes can use to uh, fund their own creative projects or companies um, and kind of sidestep that existing uh, kind of yeah startup uh, which is not or game, which is not really not often uh, something that's accessible to many people. I mean, you uh, you have to go uh, talk to investors, all that stuff. But if you have just maybe some friends and, and family, and uh, you now have this wonderful technology to actually make the future uh, vision of yourself uh, available as a pre-sale to people um, at little or yeah at little cost, then uh, I think we should make that available to as many people as possible and see. Um, more projects realized that way. Hell yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's wrap this up with um, the last question. Morris, you've already answered this, so I'll, I'll let you pass it off. <laughs> uh, can you explain blockchain in 10 words for less? <laughs> explain blockchain. Again? <laughs> yeah, always. <laughs> okay, Martin, uh, you, you, do, you do first. <laughs> I've done this two times. <laughs> <laughs> all right um, all right i mean a blockchain is a way it's a way for people for human beings to transact without trusting each other personally that's more than yes. 10 words oh he hit 11 <laughs> if he hit, he hit 11 if we if we kind of okay okay but this is okay <laughs> so this is my definition of, of blockchain Yes, it is made for humans. It is made for humans, not for the machines. Yes, it is made to uh, create new kind of interaction between people that are trustless. Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's a lot of words, but I like it. <laughs> it's certainly, the core of what the space, yeah. what the space is supposed to be for. Uh, yeah, my definition would be uh, it's a techno god that uh, gives its tribes new ways to succeed. Oh, look at Whoa. you coming up with some words for us. You've been thinking about this lately. <laughs> yes, I'm actually preparing to write a more than 2,500 word post on yeah. something like this. <laughs> All right. Okay. Magic internet money. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, there you, you go. go. <laughs> hey, are you still uh, in in uh, connection with uh, Philip Saunders, or is that that ship? I set? am. I am. Uh, he's he's a good guy. I mean, uh, he had some trouble with the the company he joined. I think Match Pool it was Match Pool. Yeah, um, and uh, it seemed they were doing some uh, not so good things. But I don't, I can't evaluate that myself because I wasn't privy to any of those interactions. But uh, he's now joined. Um, 
another company in Paris, I believe, where he's doing uh, kind of blockchain consulting work. So yeah, I'm still in contact with him over LinkedIn. Yeah, pass him a hello from us next time we talk. I will do. I will do. All right, guys. Thanks for coming on the show. I was happy to hear from you all. You too. Yeah, thank you. And we are back. Hope you enjoyed the interview with Mr. Moritz and company. Um, yeah, we had a very, very uh, interesting talk about Craig Wright prior to the interview. About Bitcoin prior to the interview. It's in a weird spot, man. Crypto's never been in a spot where this many people were involved. So, so many random opinions, so many random acts of humanity. I hope you guys trust the code. Go to the code. code just trust that. Just trust that D made Bitcoin, and uh, you'll be you'll yeah. be safe for days. I totes made this stuff after I pounded down like three egg rolls. One was pork and veggie. One was I chicken did and not veggie. See egg Last rolls one was coming. Just veggie. Oh man, I love them, bro. So so easy to make. So tasty. So that's like uh, probably. I is it is hashtag is that racist? Like. I Black pounded out a bunch of egg rolls, rolls so I decided to call myself a Japanese person. Oh, that is racist. Unless Ooh, you wow. put fried chicken in your egg roll, then you're okay. Oh, we're getting bad. We we haven't we haven't done any alienation in a while. We should probably start working on that. I'm gonna have to not edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you squeeze anyway. watermelon juice over your okay, egg rolls? Stop. Just, yeah, how, do you just squeeze, how do you squeeze That's watermelon so juice? Or like a <laughs> lemon? You know, you have a little piece of watermelon. No, the only, oh, type, the, the only type of watermelon juice that ever exists is the kind that's on your face because you've put in the rind up against your cheek. That's, <laughs> that's it. There's no, like, it's just falling down your face because you can't get the watermelon in your mouth properly. I just, I just pictured myself, like, squeezing a wedge of watermelon. <laughs> Letting the juice fall on like a salad or like a chicken breast. I'm like making that a, you know, we should make some stupid tool and sell it on those. What is it like? What's that channel where you sell stuff on TV? Uh, you QVC? know, yeah, QVC. Just QVC. Like, She's on Shark Tank. We could take two forks and put a rubber band on them so they clamp like together. And then that's what you use to squeeze watermelon juice onto your. I <laughs> just use like a garlic clamp. Corey, whoa, we're trying to invent something here. <laughs> Get out of here with those ideas. Have you ever had like that, like that conflicting thought where like you and your family are having KFC for dinner, and you're like, "Man, this is such a stereotype, but it's it's delicious." Fuck it. Nope. Yeah, I'm gonna embrace it. I, I actually, understand. I've never had that thought because I'm a white male. I'm yeah, a pop Corey. Guy. That. A question was not directed at you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a salmon dinner and been like, ah? What's no. the stereo? What's the stereotype for for white for for extra white family? Parsnips. Never had parsnips. You never had parsnips. Never, never had parsnips. What kind of white person are you, Corey? Apparently, a terrible artichokes. One. Artichoke. Uh, I don't think I've ever actually eaten artichoke either. What about soggy carrots? I know you've eaten some <laughs> soggy carrots. What in are your life, soggy yeah. carrots? You mean like cooked carrots? That's what a soggy. Yeah, like cooked carrots. Yeah, that's not that's not called a soggy carrot. It's called a cooked yeah, carrot. But you, you put it in. Stews. You guys love to make them. I've eaten <laughs> I've eaten lots of dinners with my white brethren. You guys like some soggy. Oh, carrots. I oh, I'm, I'm all about that. And you gobble them up, and I'm always like these are extremely soggy. These are really <laughs> soggy. How else but, would you eat them raw? No, you just don't boil them that long. And they them. actually taste good, but you don't I boil think, them; you steam them. Well, well, the ones that I have eaten have been coming out of water that because they were boiled and no, they were if, soggy. If you're making if you're making carrots and they're soggy, it's because it's in a stew, and pretty much and if you're eating a stew, everything is the same consistency. You're just pretty much eating muck. It tastes yeah, like it's like a meat KFC you famous bowl, and you pick the carrots same. out of it. Is my anthropological research leads me to believe that my Caucasian brethren like soggy carrots? Well, I can, I can, I can say yes. I like soggy carrots. Cool. <laughs> Opening a fast food spot tomorrow called the soggy, <laughs> the soggy carrots. I think that's going to be like a sexual reference. Corey's, we're at the, we're having dinner, and one of Corey's sides is carrots. We'll be like, yeah, we knew it. I'm taking a picture. I'm putting. <laughs> I it knew it. <laughs> He's going to order it so seriously. Like, ah, I'll have the carrots. 
All the, all the carrots. Extra nobody, soggy, please. Nobody okay. orders a side of carrots. We might as well wrap up. No, we're wrapping uh, up. Uh, let's see. We're on at the BTC podcast. That's our Twitter handle. Tweet at us. We'll tweet back. We did this thing. I think like three people answered it. It was like hashtag this is why and at J-E-R-7-9-6, uh, which is uh, Jeremy Epstein. 979. 979. Uh, at J-E-R-979. Sorry. And uh, you can keep doing that. Tell us why you listen to us. That'd be cool. We're trying to figure that out so we can be better at this because you always should be trying to get better at stuff. Um, that, uh, I think Bruce Lee said that, that quote. Always try to get better at stuff. Um, let's see. What else did we do? Corey writes these amazing. Corey, you're like a rock star now. I Aren't you a top writer? For? Oh, I'm a, I'm a top writer in investing, which tells you how shitty media investing is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Corey, where should I put my money? Tell me now. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to do that. Um, let's see here. We're on join, Medium. Join the Slack. Yeah, Slack's getting pretty popular, man. Oh, and yeah. to all you people that liked us on Facebook last week, holy hell, thanks. Yeah, we had, a, we had a long conversation on. between yesterday and this morning about the objective quality of a PhD and how that reflects to the where that places you in the distribution of all intellect. Yeah. But that's the, that's the Slack conversation we had. Was, and then that, that the moved... S- and then that immediately moved into let's go to the random section here. That was that was a weird. that immediately moved into Dave Chappelle's Breakfast Club video. Yeah, and, Rick and if you have a degree and you work at McDonald's, it's only because you have a criminal record and or had a baby, a lot of babies. <laughs> or you are work in, you could also work in San Francisco. You could be like a yeah. like a like a nerdy white dude in San Francisco. Who has a super extra degree but can't get a job, <laughs> mm-hmm. or you're and disenfranchised in the rest of the that country? Was weird, that was a weird <laughs> conversation. You guys went on for like hours of that thing. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Uh, Google the Bitcoin Podcast Network. We have shows. We have like all sorts of stuff out there. It's hard to keep track. Maybe we should do better about keep track of the things we do, right? No, I'm just like, no, just do stuff and put it on the internet. Yeah, I like. I that. can I can tell I like people. That. Uh, we got not another Bitcoin podcast. Uh, with Ken Bozak, two episodes hitting you next week, and um, next week we got Jonathan Chester from Bitwage, who hasn't been on the show since episode fifteen. Mm-hmm. And anything else that comes up is a is a is a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So we are the top three. One, two, three, four, five. We're the top like six of the seven results when you Google the Bitcoin Podcast Network. So cool, man. It's hard to not find us. I think we're doing our I think we're doing well. We're the heroes that Bitcoin needs but doesn't deserve. Um, oh, hold on, hold up. We should start We're the we... heroes that Bitcoin deserves but doesn't need. No, needs but doesn't deserve. Am I saying that right, Cello? You know what I'm talking about, right? The, the Dark Knight? Right. Yeah, I'm talking about the Batman movies. I'm the hero. Uh, Gotham needs but doesn't deserve. Are we the Dark Knight because you're black? Yes. Okay. I'm cool with that. All right. Uh, join, join the Slack because I would like to create the biggest cryptocurrency pool on the Mayweather-McGregor fight. So if you're interested in betting some crypto... I feel like that's a terrible. Slack. I feel like it's a terrible solicitation. Yeah, I feel like you're trying <laughs> like to have my like That's a terrible solicitation. <laughs> Hashtag do it. Did you just yeah. Kanye shoulder us on on Skype just now? I'm hey, doing it. It's all right. about the community. Um. Well, shout out to Zoe. Um. I know you're out there. I seen you the other day, looking good. Keep doing your thing. Can't wait for Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and 4. Um, probably not going to happen, but I'm rooting for you, girl. All right. You guys got Avatar. any shout outs? Avatar 2 is, is filming. Oh, yeah. So if you're tired of looking at her in green, you get to see her in blue. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's actually blue green, and I'm okay with it. Is I already said teal? I'd be. Isn't that just called teal? Space- well, yeah, if you want to be like, I don't know, an interior designer about it. But if you want to be a dude, we're going to say, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That was, that's bad. There's, She's aquamarine. Um, yeah, aquamarine. That's a good one, too. Um, I'm into interspecies kind of stuff. So 10-foot blue. Zoe Saldana walk through the door. Does that mean you, I, that mean you have sex with goats? Interspecies no, are that's not no, no, no. that's not something no, you say no, out no. loud, D. No, I'm no, no, into no. interspecies no. kind of stuff. No, no, like, you literally like just said that out loud. Yeah, but that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Well, we can we can I we was... can audio cut the shit out of that. Yeah, but I do the editing, so win for me. I'm talking about like <laughs> <laughs> I'm am t- talking about like that blue avatar alien, that specific inter avatar. Course. I'll tell you this right now. If like the world was more like the Fifth Element, I mean, there, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that's all. Yeah. yeah, there wouldn't be so much humans and humans. I call, there'd, I call a lot of I call Chris Tucker in that in that movie. Mm-hmm. There'd be a lot uh, of erotic. We need to, we need to stop. Yeah, <laughs> play the outro.